So let's talk about this with Representative Steve Cohen. He's a Democrat from Tennessee. Welcome, sir. Thank you, Carol. Um, first question, Republicans say the Office of Congressional Ethics has run amok. You heard what Phil Mattingly had to say. They, they were, it was accusing lawmakers, innocent lawmakers of wrongdoing. This is what one of your incoming colleagues from Florida said, Republican Fr uh, Brian Mast. Let's listen. So there are certainly members on both sides of the aisle that, that want to see this entity go away because of the, the, the very far-fetched investigations that have gone on that they've had to spend, you know, literally hundreds of thousands of dollars as individuals uh, to get rid of these investigations that had no merit whatsoever. Is that how you see it, Congressman? Well, I think the optics of it are just awful. They're horrendous. And if Kevin McCarthy and Paul Ryan are against it, which I suspect they are because they're a little bit more experienced than most of the members of the caucus, it shows a problem in the Republican caucus with the membership understanding some experienced and, and wise Congress people who want to see the optics be different and also want to see ethics maybe prevail. I think this portends problems with leadership, uh, having the uh, caucus, the conference as they call it, uh, behind them. Again, move and forward I think forward an agenda to great again. Congressman, this is Mike Pence. He's speaking outside of Trump Tower. Let's listen. Uh, we'll look forward to legislation that will give us the, uh, the tools to roll back the avalanche of red tape and regulation that have been stifling American jobs and growth. Uh, but the president-elect uh, has a very clear message to Capitol Hill, and that is uh, it's time to get to work, and it's, uh, it's time to uh, keep our word to the American people uh, to make this country great again, make it prosperous again, and uh, we look forward to being on Capitol Hill tomorrow. Say again. Uh, we receive regular intelligence uh, briefings, and uh, uh, I'll be joining the president-elect today for a, a routine intelligence briefing. But I think over the course of uh, the coming days, uh, the president-elect will be receiving more information about that and uh, other topics on the world stage. And have okay. You lost confidence in the U.S. intelligence community. Uh, I, I think uh, the uh, the challenges that America faces on the world stage are going to be met with renewed American strength and renewed American leadership. Uh, rebuilding our military, engaging uh, leaders around the world as the president-elect uh, has done uh, on a personal basis uh, is all part and parcel of, uh, of, I think, a new season. It's 2017. Uh, we're just a few weeks away from a new administration taking office. And I think uh, the world will see that uh, with, with our president-elect uh, taking office uh, that America will be standing tall in the world again, engaging the world again, and standing standing firmly for America's interests. Thank you all. All right, so that's Vice President-elect Mike Pence talk, talking outside of Trump Tower. Congressman, I apologize for so rudely interrupting you. We wanted to get in what Mike Pence was saying on, on this ethics commission. We missed the first part of what, what he had to say, but, but you can see that, um, that Mike Pence was, was choosing his words carefully when it came to the dismantling of this ethics commission. So I guess I'll ask you again, the Trump people seem to think, you know, they're taking a wait and see attitude. Republicans say that it was a commission running amok, and you again have to say why. Well, I, you know, I haven't seen it running amok, and I don't know that it's, I certainly know it's bad optics for this to be the first thing for this Congress to do. This was a Democratic uh, provision put in by Nancy Pelosi after there was corruption on both sides of the aisle. I think the American public's not, rating of Congress is very low, and this will certainly make it lower. I think if the Congress is supposed to be the body closest to the people, which it is, and responsive to the people, they would not deal with this issue. And I think it shows a problem with the leadership, uh, Paul Ryan and Kevin McCarthy, who apparently were against this, and their membership that don't see the wisdom of not going forward. And this, could, this is going to be indicative of problems down the line, and it's going to show where Paul Ryan may very well need Democratic votes to pass any measures at all on transportation infrastructure or some of the better things that he wants to do. Mm -hmm. uh, on another matter, there's another item at the top of the agenda in this 115th Congress, and that would be punishment. Last summer, Democratic lawmakers, including yourself, staged a sit-in on the House floor to force Republicans to act on gun control. Democrats periscoped it, which enabled C-SPAN to broadcast the video, and that was in violation of House rules. Republicans want to impose fines on lawmakers for breaking the rules, and that means you. Are you afraid? Not afraid at all. I'll stand and, or sit with John Lewis anywhere. John Lewis led us in that uh, demonstration and protest. The Republican leadership turned the cameras off, the C-SPAN cameras, and some of our younger, more techie uh, members 
got the periscope and whatever other means there were to televise this to the people of the world. It was almost like being in an Eastern European Republic where the protests were cut off by the uh, and repression, repressive administration. John Lewis knew that there were certain areas where there was you needed to stand up and make a difference. He said there's, there's trouble and there's good trouble. And this was good trouble. There was good trouble in the 60s with voting rights and civil rights, and this was good trouble. They wouldn't take a gun control bill that would have simple gun control. No, no, if you can't get on, the, on an airplane, you shouldn't be able to buy a gun. No fly, no buy. The votes were there to pass it, but the House Republican rules wouldn't let it come to a vote. We were trying to see it come to a vote. We wanted to see some sanity in seeing people who are terrorist threats not get guns and terrorize our people. Still, to periscope from the House floor was a violation of the rules, and evidently the fines imposed um, would be what? 500 bucks for the first offense, $2,500 for a second offense, and those fines would be deducted directly from your paycheck. And they would be it's levied by a House staff member, which I think is an unconstitutional um, rule uh, appropriate uh, abrogation. The House members should vote on the fines themselves, not uh, a staffer who they are delegating that position to. So I think it's unconstitutional. I think it's a question of freedom of speech and freedom of protest and First Amendment. And it's another bad optic that the Republicans have in this rules package. It's hard to fathom why they come with gutting the Ethics Commission and then having a, uh, uh, an iron fist come down on what was a very popular and I think righteous protest to show that the House was not operating in regular order and not allowing bills to come to the floor that had the votes of the majority of the membership. But some people might say that Republicans are, are trying to insert, exert total control over the Congress so they can get things done and marginalize Democrats. Do you think this is all part of that critique? Oh, no question they would marginalize Democrats and they, this shows that they're going to have a heavy hand and that's really unfortunate. You know what we're looking at overall here, Carol, is oligarchy. When Citizens United lets the wealthiest people put more and more money into the government, when one of the priorities of this Republican team is to cut taxes, particularly for the wealthiest, and eliminate the inheritance tax, which would benefit the 5,000 richest families in the country each year, not to have to pay any inheritance tax, it gives the, the rich more and more money and more and more power. Right now, the Republican cabinet that you're looking at is a cut out the middleman cabinet. They're putting the billionaires as the cabinet members. And you buy your way in with campaign contributions to, to the Trump campaign. And then rather than have experienced people operate the departments, they're putting inexperienced billionaires in. So it truly is an oligarchy in the formation. And you know, the scary thing is about his position with Russia. The last two people I remember in this Western Hemisphere that were so close to Russia were Armand Hammer, who loved oil and money, and Fidel Castro who loved to talk for long periods of time, hated disloyalty and dissent, and eliminated it, and was very much an egocentric individual. So, so you're, I, comparing I'm afraid Donald some Trump, you're comparing Donald Trump to Fidel Castro? Personality traits, indeed. Castro really? wanted to be, he, Cast, if you watch the Netflix program on Cuba Libre. Castro needed to be the center of attention at all time. He executed certain of his comrades for trumped up charges because he wanted total control and wanted to put that fear into people. He was very close to his family, and he, and he had a, a multitudinous family, uh, didn't trust others, and it was all about him and public speaking, and he liked to speak on ad infinitum. He was not, uh, uh, with the exception of the fact that he was dedicated to a philosophy and to his country, making a, a comp allegiance with Russia, there are a lot of uh, personality traits that are similar. Well, Congressman, I, I feel I have to push back on you because those who support Trump and support a better relationship with Russia would certainly disagree with you. They would say that Donald Trump is just trying to evoke change and get Washington to work, especially Congress, which hasn't, which hasn't worked very well in the last, oh, more than several years, more than a decade? I don't think it's anything to do with Congress. I don't think he even understands the tripartite system of government we have in the Congress under Article One as an independent branch of government. I don't think he understands that it's Congress and really uh, uh, the, the Judiciary Committee that can bring impeachment charges. He needs to work with Congress and not threaten people like Paul Ryan and threaten other people as he did during his campaign. You don't bully people to have a system work. Uh, you need to work together. And I don't think this is about Congress and I think he thinks he can do a lot by executive action and by independent action that he can't do unless the Congress passes appropriations bills that are similar to what he proposes. They're trying to cut out Medicaid. They're trying to cut out uh, limit Medicaid and change it to a voucher system, make people work, 
if you're sick and you can't work, you should still get Medicaid. They're going to try to eliminate the Affordable Care Act. People are going to die because they can't get health care. Community health centers will be limited in the funds they get. The people at the bottom will be hurt. The people at Lago Mar, which is his focus group, it'll be a great life for them. Still, it's a great life now, but your focus group as a president should not be Lago Mar. Or I have to leave it or there. Or Mar-a-Lago um, or whatever it is. I haven't Mar -a -Lago. been there. Mar-a-Lago. Yeah. Congressman Cohen, thank you so much for being with me this morning. You're welcome, Still Carol. I'm sorry about the oh, guys. Oh, me too. That was awful. <laughs> it was just so awful. I don't like to think about it. Thanks for being with me, Congressman. Still to come in the newsroom, Trump's foreign policy in 140 characters. One small sentence. Big consequences?